Hello and welcome to this edition of 5 Minutes or Less of EMS. I'm your host, Kevin Mackey, and we come to you today from Station 72 of Kasumas Fire District. I'm with Tiana Kiersing, who's a paramedic on the C shift today, and we're going to talk about spinal motion restriction. Tiana, I guess you've gotten some questions sent to you and to the EMS division, so I thought I'd take a chance and answer. Why the change in spinal immobilization, Dr. Mackey? Three large groups, the surgeons, the emergency physicians, and the EMS physicians came together and developed a position statement last August in 2018. And that position statement has formulated the standard of care for the United States. Okay. So that's where a lot of the local EMS agencies are drawing from to develop new policies. Great. What is spinal motion restriction? Uh, we've used spinal mobilization for a long time, but we've known forever that we don't really immobilize the spine. We just want to restrict the motion of a potentially injured spine. So the change of terms is more accurate to what we're doing, which is spinal motion restriction. But the two of them are really synonymous. Is a collar and an ambulance cot considered the same as spinal motion restriction? Yes. In the policy statement and the position statement put out by these three organizations, they are considered the same thing. Dr. Mackey, what about the mechanism of injury? Does that no longer matter when considering immobilizing the spine? I wouldn't say mechanism of injury doesn't matter at all, but the American College of Surgeons certainly has downplayed it. As a matter of fact, they've taken it out of their recommended triage criteria. We use it to predict kinematics and patterns of injury, but the important thing to remember, and I think this is where the confusion comes from, is that local EMS agencies base their policies in conjunction with trauma centers on what they consider important. So just because the American College of Surgeons says, ah, oh, we don't consider mechanism anymore, you might see an activation criteria at a local hospital that will include mechanism, like for example, here in Sacramento is still speed, freeway speed traffic, that creates a trauma activation. That's not anywhere in the American College of Surgeons guidelines, that's a local decision. Oh, interesting, good to keep in mind. Is, is the KED the same as the long spinal board? It is. They're both extrication devices, but when you use a KED, you don't need to use a long spine board. Use one or the other. Why is spinal immobilization no longer needed for victims of penetrating trauma? I get this question a lot. The Eastern Association for the Surgery of Trauma, they're called EAST, you can Google it, uh, they produce guidelines that are followed internationally. And what that organization did just last year is they reviewed all of the known research and articles and literature about penetrating trauma and spinal injuries. And what they found is two interesting things. The injury to the spine in penetrating trauma is exceedingly rare. So they suggested don't immobilize penetrating trauma anymore. But what they also found, which is probably more interesting that most people don't know, is there's actual increased mortality from immobilizing folks with penetrating injuries. So that makes you wonder why. Mm -hmm. And the only thing I can really come up with is airway compromise and ventilation compromise. People with penetrating chest injuries especially develop hemothorax. If you lay them on their back on a spine board, they essentially have respiratory compromise. So penetrating trauma, we don't immobilize anymore or do spinal motion restriction. Wow, thank you for clarifying. Absolutely. What is a distracting injury? Um, only really been looked at in one article, thoracic injuries, multiple rib fractures, those are truly distracting. Fractured femurs might be distracting, but really at the end of the day you have to use your judgment. But a sprained ankle or a broken wrist really isn't distracting enough to cause someone to not know that they've fractured their spine. Okay. Are there downsides to fully immobilizing the spine? Uh, using a long spine board, there's definitely downsides. So elderly get more pressure sores. That is for sure known and recognized. Anybody who comes in on a long, long spine board, for some reason or another, we tend to do more radiographs. And then of course, the big one is, is that being on a spine board is uncomfortable. It changes your exam and it makes examining someone a little bit more difficult because they're in pain everywhere. Interesting. Aren't I going to get in trouble at the hospital for not immobilizing the spine? Oftentimes the hospital isn't familiar with our policies. Uh, that does happen, unfortunately, and because the policies do change, not every healthcare provider, nurse, doctor in the county is current on the policies. Follow your policies. Don't worry about the hospital side of things. If you get complaints, or you get concerns, just refer them up to the EMS division and the two of us will take care of it. Great. Thank you. 
Thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Tiana, for the great questions. I appreciate that. You'll find three links below. One of them is to the position statement, one's to the East Guidelines, and one's to the County Policy. Click on them, check out what they say, and then also don't forget to subscribe to my channel. Have a good day.